favorite parts about being a guitar player is being able to record myself, being able to record songs and ideas that I write. And when I think back to being a beginner, I remember how intimidating and difficult it was to learn. So today's video is going to demystify some of this stuff. We're going to focus on microphones. We're going to talk about how they work, the different types of microphones. We're going to let you hear different microphones on the same source so you can actually hear the differences. We're going to show you how to place your microphone on the guitar speaker and the differences that it makes in terms of sound. So if you're new to the recording process and you're thinking about getting your first microphone and you don't know what to get or you don't know the differences between the microphones, this video is going to help you out. Now, if you check the description box down below, you're going to find a link to a video course I made last year called the Tone Course. The concepts that we're talking about today are covered in more detail in the Tone Course, as well as a wide variety of other things dedicated to the ins and outs of great guitar tone. How amps work and how to dial in amps, the different types of effects and using them and how to stack them together. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about great guitar tone and recording guitars at home, check out the Tone Course. The link down below will give you 20 20% off of the tone course. So if you're interested, check that out. All right, without any further ado, let's take a look at the microphones we're gonna be using in today's video. <laughs> So at its very core, a microphone is what's known as a transducer. A transducer is any mechanism that converts a physical energy, pressure, sound waves, for example, into electrical energy or an electrical signal or vice versa. So the speakers in your car or in your earbuds or in your smartphone are transducers. They're taking an electrical signal and converting them into sound waves, into sound pressure. A microphone is doing the opposite. When you sing into a mic or speak or play an acoustic guitar or or an electric guitar amp into the microphone, the sound waves are essentially vibrating a diaphragm. And depending on the mic and its circuitry and its inherent design, essentially it's just converting that sound energy into an electrical signal that then travels out of the XLR cable into your recording interface, tape machine, voice memo on your phone, whatever medium you're recording that signal onto. Now, for the purposes of this video, we're gonna talk about three different types of microphones, the three most common. Now, there are more types of microphones out there than just the three in this video, but these are arguably the three most common, especially that you'll encounter as a guitar player. Starting with large diaphragm condenser microphones, ribbon microphones, and dynamic mics. So let's start with the dynamic mic. This is the Shure SM57. This is arguably the industry standard guitar microphone. Actually, just industry standard in many different ways. These are used on drums, on vocals. So the way a dynamic mic works, like the 57, is very simple. Up here at the front of the microphone, we have what's called the diaphragm. And the diaphragm in a dynamic microphone like the 57 is essentially like a little speaker. So sound waves come in through the front grill and they hit the diaphragm, vibrating that diaphragm back and forth, which creates an electrical signal. It's literally the inverse of a speaker. Then that signal travels through the mic, it hits a transformer in the circuitry here, and it travels out through the XLR cable to your interface. Now, dynamic microphones like the 57 are good at a few different things. First of all, they can handle very, very loud volumes, like way louder than just about any guitar amp could produce. I would recommend this as your first mic. If you're just getting into recording and working at home, go out and buy a 57 or even a pair of 57s if you like. The next microphone we're gonna look at is the condenser mic. Now, when you think of a microphone and you envision a mic in your head, you might be thinking of something that looks like this. This is what's known as a large diaphragm condenser. And this works in a slightly different way than the dynamic microphone works. Instead of having a diaphragm that's essentially like a tiny speaker uh, in the microphone, we have what's called a capsule. Now, a capsule is made of two parts. You have a rigid back plate, oftentimes made of brass, and then very, very close to that back plate, you have what's called the diaphragm. Now, the back 
back plate does not move, but the diaphragm does. So when you speak into the capsule of the mic, that front diaphragm is moving ever so slightly. In fact, here you can see that reflective material inside the capsule, that is the diaphragm. Now when that front diaphragm starts to move back and forth and the distance between those two elements changes, it creates a voltage. But the signal is very, very weak. So it requires some kind of amplification device in the microphone itself. Now this can be done in a few different ways. First of all, is sending what's called phantom power down the XLR cable into the microphone to power the circuitry in here and to help amplify the small electrical signal coming from the capsule. Now, but not all condenser mics work off of phantom power. For example, this mic is a tube condenser. So it is still a large diaphragm condenser like the blue here, but there's an actual vacuum tube inside the body of this microphone that is amplifying the signal. Now tube mics need an external power supply. Now along with large diaphragm condenser mics, we also have small diaphragm condenser mics like this Earthworks SR25. These are also sometimes called pencil mics for obvious reasons. And although these two microphones look completely different, they function in a very similar way. Now, sound-wise, condenser mics are much more sensitive than their dynamic counterparts. You're gonna get more high-end and more low-end. They're also much more sensitive to quieter sound sources like the human voice, for example. They're really great for picking up small details and just an overall higher fidelity sound. They're fantastic on acoustic instruments, fantastic on drums and room mics and vocals. And as you're gonna see in just a second, they can sound really great on guitar amps. And last but not least, we have the ribbon microphone. Now, I love ribbon mics, and these are actually really historic. From about the 1930s until the early to mid 70s, um, ribbons were used primarily uh, as the main mic for just about everything from broadcast to, to radio to television to movies to everything. Now, even the ribbons are somewhat old technology, they still work really well. See, like the name would suggest, the diaphragm inside a ribbon mic is an actual ribbon of corrugated aluminum metal, very, very thin strip of aluminum suspended between two magnets inside the microphone and then that's connected to a transformer. Now ribbon mics a lot of times are known for being the most natural sounding microphones, somewhat close to the way the human ear would actually hear a sound source in the room. They're known for being incredibly accurate. Now there's one thing to know about ribbon microphones that is super, super important. In fact, I just hired a full-time production assistant to come in and start helping me run the channel and produce content and run the studio. And the first thing that I told him on his first day was never run phantom power to a ribbon microphone. If you do, you'll end up blowing the ribbon. Now, that's not true for all ribbon microphones. There are some active ribbon mics out there, but just as a general rule, if you're using a ribbon, do not turn on phantom power. So I've talked enough about these mics. I think the best thing to do is to actually let you hear them. So before we hear the mics, the amp we're gonna be using today is the Fender Tweed Deluxe. This is the 57 Custom Reissue. Has an Alnico speaker in it, and you may notice a bit of a continuity error here in that uh, in some of the shots, there is no hole in a grill cloth, and now there is a hole in a grill cloth. And that's because the light that I used to show the inside of the speaker ended up getting really hot and melting the grill cloth. So I will be replacing that soon. So now you're gonna hear the exact difference between the SM57, the Baby Bottle SL, and the Royer R121. They are placed exactly in the same spot on the speaker cone. Nothing changed with the amp setup, and we're using a loop from the HX effects to play the exact same part. So we're gonna start off with the 57, then you're gonna hear the condenser, the Baby Bottle SL, and then you're gonna hear the ribbon, the 121. And this should show you exactly the difference between these three microphones.
you should have noticed a pretty massive difference in sound between those three microphones. And to me, that's really interesting. Uh, how could three microphones on the same source sound so different? First of all is construction. Like we talked about, the different mics and the way they work will influence the sound. But the biggest thing is the frequency response. Now, frequency response is how we judge the tone of the mic, for lack of a better term. And uh, you can look at the frequency response of a mic that's been measured uh, in a graph. And I'll put one up here as an example. So if you notice in that recording, the SM57 was the brightest of the three mics. And when you look at its frequency response curve, you can see a bump in the upper mid range. That is part of the inherent voice of the 57. They're known for having that top end sizzle and bite, which is why so many people use them on guitar amps. Now the Baby Bottle SL, for example, has the opposite in terms of frequency response. It's got a lot more low end and it's a lot warmer in tone, whereas the 121 was a little bit more flat. Now, flat response microphones like this SR25, for example, are really great uh, for applications where you don't want to color the sound. You just want to accurately capture what's there without the microphone imparting its own sort of flavor. But mics that have a more colorful response are really great to use, like the 57 or like that baby bottle or like my U87 here. Now, the other big thing to understand about microphones is polar patterns. Now, polar patterns are essentially uh, where the microphone is most sensitive uh, in regards to where a sound source is coming from. And there's three main polar pattern types to be aware of. The first and arguably most common is what's called a cardioid pattern. Now, my U87 here will actually let you switch polar patterns. And right now you can see it's in the cardioid mode. And that little picture Picture, the little diagram that sort of looks like an upside down heart is a perfect representation of the cardioid polar pattern. What that means is the microphone is most sensitive right in front of the capsule here. And as you start to move off axis of that capsule, it gets less and less sensitive uh, and it gets darker and darker to the point where on the back side of the capsule, 180 degrees on the other side, it should be rejecting all sound. Now, cardioid mics are very popular. The 57 is a cardioid pattern. The Baby Bottle SL also has a cardioid pattern. And they're really great because they are good at sort of taming uh, sound. If you're recording in an untreated space, for example, they can help reject sound and, and tame feedback. <laughs> Now, the next polar pattern we can switch the 87 to here is called omnidirectional, and that's signified by a circle there. Now, omni just means that the microphone is completely sensitive in 360 degrees, and that's really useful for recording um, a room sound, room ambience, for example, or recording acoustic instruments like pianos or acoustic guitars. The downside is um, if you're using this in a live setting, it's going to open you up to feedback. And if you're recording in a room that doesn't sound particularly good, it's going to highlight that. <laughs> And the last polar pattern to look at is what's called figure eight or figure of eight, uh, some people call it. And this, as the picture might show, means that the microphone is picking up in front of the mic and behind the mic equally, and it's rejecting what's on the sides. The Royer R121 is a figure eight mic, which is part of its sound. It's picking up the sound coming off of the speaker, but it's also picking up the sound coming from behind the amp, which in my room here is the guitar sound bouncing off of the opposing wall and coming back in. <laughs> So no matter what microphone you might be using to mic up a guitar speaker, there is a really important concept to understand when it comes to recording, and that is microphone placement on the speaker. Now, you may not be aware, but the speaker doesn't sound the same across its entire width. In fact, there's a pretty big difference between the center of the speaker cone and the edge. 
So in the center of the speaker, we have what's called the dust cap, which is this little uh, bump right here in the middle. Right there in the middle of the speaker is where all of your top end, all of your high end information from the speaker is coming from. And as you get closer to the edge of the speaker, the more low end and low mid range that you get. Now where you end up placing your mic on the speaker has a massive difference in the tone. And I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna take an SM57, we're gonna play another loop from the HX effects, and I'm gonna sit and move the mic back and forth and listen to the amount of difference there is from the center to the edge. to mic placement than just where we're putting it on the speaker cone. There's two other areas to be involved. First of all is distance from the speaker. The closer we end up putting the microphone to the speaker, the more low end you're gonna get. This is called the proximity effect, and it doesn't just happen with speakers. You take your smartphone, the voice memo app, and experiment with talking into your phone about you know a foot to two feet away, and then slowly move the phone closer to your mouth, you're gonna start to hear more low end, more bass come through uh, in the recording. And the last thing to think about is the axis of the microphone. What I mean by that is how are we placing the microphone in relation to the speaker cone. So if we were to picture the speaker from a top-down view, somewhat like this, if we have our mic pointed directly at the speaker, that's called on axis. But we can also tilt the mic like this, meaning we're moving the mic closer to the edge, but we're still pointing the mic capsule at the center of the speaker. That's called off axis. You can also go the other way, where you stay in the middle of the speaker cone, but point your mic towards the edge of the speaker. Now, like our mic placement on the cone, on axis versus off axis has a massive effect on the tone as well. Check this out. <laughs> When I'm recording guitars at home or in a studio, I like to use more than one microphone. This will give you a more flexible tone to work with uh, in the mix process. And you can combine two microphones to make an amplifier sound bigger than it actually is, or sound more mid-range focused than it actually is, or brighter than it actually is. You can use the microphones and their inherent character to kind of help shape the character of your sound. Now for me, one of my favorite mic combinations to use just about anywhere is a Royer R121 and the Sure SM57. The ribbon mic and the dynamic mic combo is super great because they balance each other out really well. The Royer being really warm and very accurate with a lot of low end works really well with this 57's kind of top end sizzle and kick. They complement each other really well. So in the mix process, you can record both mics on the same speaker. In this case, we're on two different speakers if you happen to have that in your cabinet and then blend them to taste in your DAW. guitar sounds in your mix. But there's a few things to keep in mind when you're recording the same source with more than one microphone. The first and most important thing to look out for is phase. When you're using two microphones on the same source, in this case, the speaker, the diaphragms of the microphone, or in this case, the diaphragm and the ribbon of these two microphones need to be lined up with one another. If they're not lined up, one is further ahead than the other, what happens is the sound waves hit those two diaphragms at different times. And if this phase relationship or the distance between these two mics gets too far apart, uh, things will start to get out of phase, which means you'll start to lose low end or certain frequencies will start to cancel each other out and it's generally not a very pleasant sound. 
So the first thing I always do when I'm setting up mics is get them placed on the speaker like we talked about. Then I will check and see if the diaphragms are lined up with one another. And once you're ready to record, there's a few ways to check if you're in phase. Uh, first of all is flip the phase on one mic. If you flip the phase and all of your low end goes away, then you know that you are pretty much in phase. But if you flip the phase and you start to get more low end or you don't really notice a change, then you need to check your mic placement. The other way and the way that I like to do it is record a snippet of audio and then go into your DAW and zoom in super close on the waveforms. If you zoom in far enough, you can actually see the waveforms represented on the screen and they should more or less line up with one another. The most important way to check if they're in phase is use your ears. If it's lacking low end or it sounds nasally or sounds out of phase it probably is so that's a beginner's guide to recording guitar at home looking at microphones if you enjoyed today's video let me know by leaving a like and a comment down below be sure to subscribe and click the bell icon for more content like this in the very near future don't forget to check out the tone course again the link down below will give you 20 percent off of the tone course uh, and that's only available through this video through that link so if you're interested in picking up the tone course do it through there let me know what you want me to cover next in this beginner guide to home recording series in the comments section down below. Should we talk about DAWs? Should we talk about mic preamps and EQs and compression? Uh, let me know. Anyways, that's going to do it for today's video. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Rhett Scholl, and remember, there is no plan B.